the three mountains, um, the Gnostic path of initiation. And as I've heard, you guys got a little bit about this already. You did the probator path in phase B, you said. So we're going to do a bit of a review on that. And then we're going to go into the three mountains, which is the, the main Gnostic work. There's that famous picture again we get to see all the time. The true goal of the Gnostic path is to return to the source from whence we came, the Absolute. We gradually incarnate the being as we go. This, so, so this idea of the three mountains, this is actually the whole true goal of the, of the work that we're doing. This is the culmination of everything we're working towards. The birth, the death, the sacrifices, also we can be initiated into these three mountains initiation, which all happens in this higher realms, but it also crystallizes down, as we'll see. This is the Gnostic path of initiation right here. So you previously looked at the probator path. From that leads to the three mountains. And we're going to go through and look at each one of these sections in this lecture. Um, as you can see right off the bat, we have guardians of the thresholds on three different planes. We have the tests of the elements, <coughs> the eight minor initiations, and that makes up the entire probative path. So you may recognize that. You guys remember that, that stuff? And then from there, we go on to the three mountains. The big difference with the three mountains themselves is that working with the three factors of birth, death, and sacrifice now is a necessity. You have to work with those three factors to, to become beyond the mountains. Without them, you can't do it. You can't do it. You have to do the, the death, the birth, the sacrifice, the alchemy, transmutation, uh, elimination of the egos, and sacrificing for humanity. It has to be done throughout the entire, the entirety of the three mountains work. And it's called the three mountains not because they're actual mountains, but because it's like climbing a mountain. It's a difficult climb, and and you have to constantly work. But at the top, at the peak of the first and second mountain, there's a rest, and they sometimes call it as coming back down. So you know, you fight hard, and then you get the easy path back down. Then you fight hard, then back down. Then at the peak of the third mountain, you ascend into the absolute, the source from whence we all came. And that's what we're trying to do with this Gnostic path. Yes? Um, so when uh, someone describes accessing the absolute, or samadhi and meditation, mm -hmm. is it also implied that as a microcosm that uh, they have to go through in the astral during their process of meditation, they're going through each of those steps before they reach the absolute, or is this more so just the the path uh, this, on macrocosm? This is this is the path of the razor's edge, the direct path that you walk. So some idea would be an experience of what kind of levels of ecstasy you can reach, but not the fullness of the extent of actually entering the absolute. Okay, that's the idea. Of like same with when we when we start feeling our chakras alivening, but then it will fade again until we actually raise the kundalini up to that level of, say, the you know, solar plexus at the chakra, then that will be always permanently spinning. But as we'll see, raising the kundalini is something we have to do multiple times. And you guys are probably aware of that because of, of, of your previous classes. Cool. So with the, so the uh, probate beta path, because we're, you know, we, we aren't very awakened, we're rather unconscious individuals, um, it's, it's easy to either experience, or it, is it possible to experience an initiation in the probate of path without realizing that it was one, or, or yeah. like not even remembering it? Sure, absolutely, absolutely, you can experience that kind of stuff without remembering it. The other thing about the probate of path is that it's, it's not, um, you know, elementary. It's actually pretty advanced to be on the probate of path, and for most of us, we're leading towards the probate of path. As soon as you start working with the three factors, and maybe not all of them, maybe you're working with, you know. Uh, transmutation of the energies, but you're not working in alchemy, or maybe you're, uh, you know, kind of observing your egos, but not eliminating all of them. When you start working on them, then you're leading yourself towards the probative path, and you're going to get tests and trials thrown at you the entire time that happens too. So and we'll get into it and we'll explain it more. But the probative path is advanced too because you've already been working in this stuff. But who's on it and who's not on it isn't something that ever comes up in gnosis, not in the second chamber, not ever. No one sits around and says, oh, I'm on the second mountain, man. And, oh, I'm on the first, you know. <laughs> Nothing like that will ever come up because the work is so individual and important and it's, it's, it's occult work. It's done in secret. So what Second Chamber does is a bunch of people, we all get together. We're all working for the same goals internally, kind of giving each other support that, that way. You can think of it that way, but it's not. 
people aren't you know really exchanging experiences or saying I learned this was you learn kind of thing because all the stuff you learn is particular to you. Same sort of idea with you know if we go back to the basics of dream interpretation. A dream means different things to different people. So like what Lee was talking about on the weekend. Although there are archetypes, you can really interpret somebody else's dream 100% properly for them. Because like he always said, remember he always talks about the farm. When he was a kid, he went to his grandma's farm and he hated it. And then someone had a dream that I was at a farm. It was so beautiful and I loved it. And he's like, oh, you're at a farm? That's bad, man. It's bad news. Really, it's only bad news for him because of his personal experience. But some people might like being on a farm. So it's the same stuff with, with these initiations and stuff. It's not like the exact same initiation for everybody. It's depending on where you are in your life and your circumstances and your path. It's always slightly different. Particularly the eight minor initiations. We won't even get into them because they're all they're tailored just for the individual. You see the eight or nine? Um, in his in his book, the Three Mountains, he said nine. Mm -hmm. There are nine, but then later he said there was eight. So we always go with the eight. And yeah, then I think there's nine minor and eight major. major yeah. But I might be mistaken. No, the, he has two books and they're slightly different. But we always never we never place too much importance on the difference because mm -hmm. they are they are really individual. So whether it's eight or nine, there's still individual initiations that people go through that don't really fit the archetype. These ones fit archetypes. These ones fit archetypes. The Three Mountains definitely fits archetypes. Like generalities would be the same for everybody. But um, uh, there's cases in which uh, even in the ma major initiations, the initiate may not realize right. that he has received right. initiation. Yeah. That is the case of the first initiation of the major mysteries. Mm -hmm. The Master Samael, he didn't realize he had received the initiation. Well, the Landis reminded because, him that she was there. Yeah, because he he, it's not because he was um, uh, asleep. Right. It's just because he's the being who receives the initiation, right. not the ego, not the personality. And it's something it's we the, have to realize this duality that's going on. Because while we're fighting on, on this path of, of the three factors, our being's fighting and receiving the initiations. And our being, as we know, we're separated from our being right now. But our being is going through a lot of the work, too as we're doing initiation, they're doing initiation. So it doesn't sometimes transfer over to our consciousness. But we can remember. And as Doris Mel said, same with Samael, he went through, received an initiation, and then in the morning, Atlantis was talking to him about it, and he didn't remember things. Like, I, don't, I waited all night, and I was supposed to receive this initiation, and it never came, and it never came. And she's like, we were there. You were there, man. You know, like that. And he couldn't remember. But uh, it's just the way it is on the path. It's kind of like when you driving down the street and you have a flash of a dream. Oh yeah, I, I remember I had a dream about this last night. Same sort of thing can happen. It's more uh, You got what you need to get there, Yulia? That's why I'm here. Good. Um, yeah. good. So here comes the big question is, boom, where do I start? We got the probative path, we got these mountains, we got all this work, we got, you know, what do we do? Where can we start? It's, the answer is pretty easy. Any guesses what this is going to be? Birth, the death, and the sacrifice. You guys are too good. Yeah. Death, birth, and sacrifice. This is where we start. This is where all the work starts. That's why there are three factors. There's also the three keys and the three most important things you're going to learn in Gnosis because this is basically sums up the work. Although we go through all these initiations, all this stuff happens to us because of this, it's always only because of this. And this is what we have to work at doing daily. And even if like we're not ready for alchemy, then we're working on the egos. You know, if we're, have trouble with ego, a sacrifice for humanity for a little while, and then we can slowly bring it all together, you know. And as we get ready, more opportunities will open up for us to be able to practice the three factors. The death of the egos, the birth of the solar bodies, the sacrifice for humanity. That one's definitely going to be on the test, but everyone's going to ace it, I know, for sure. I'm the leaving it down. Three factors. Just leave it up. It'll say something like, what? explain the three factors. It'll say birth, death, no, 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 sacrifice. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Solar bodies, death of, sac of the egos, sacrifice for Three humanity. Factors. It's also a sacrifice for your for your being. Is also when you're doing the death of the egos, you're also sacrificing your lower self for your higher self. So then, in its most ample form, sacrifice we think of like the the awakened masters, you know, like Jesus and all these awakened masters who do these massive sacrifices, or the amount of work that Samael did to put out to humanity. But this can happen on smaller levels. You know, we can do this every day. I would like watching TV for two hours. You know what? I'm going to watch for one hour and I'm going to meditate for an hour. That's a sacrifice. It's not the biggest sacrifice anyone's made in the world. But that's a sacrifice. That's working with one of the three factors. 
It's that's the kind of stuff we have to think. We don't have to think of the work as being mon monumental and gigantic and like, oh, this is overwhelming, I can't do it. No, just start with small sacrifices, small transmutation practices, pranayamas, the, the hamsas. Just start, of, start with self-awareness even before you start you know, working on the egos. Get yourself in the moment. We can, we can start right now. The death, of course, is the death of the egos. And to become, spirit, to, to become a spiritual being, it is absolutely necessary that we eliminate the psychological ego, especially when we get to the three mountains, we'll see this. The work in death must begin and continue on if we wish to climb the path of Gnostic initiation. So it's not like we, we work on our egos for a bit, and then they're dead, and then we move on to the three mountains. This is a continual work, we'll see, up to, up to a certain point. It is a great work that must be completed. Every journey starts with a single step. This is my, these are my inspirational quotes here, so start now. It is a lot of work to eliminate the ego, but we can start right now. We can start right now. By being aware of the room we're in right now, we can start. Maybe not letting our mind wander during this, being like, what's going on later tonight? Even that's just a small ego. It's not the worst ego we have, but we can start, we can start right now by observing that. I mean, we're on this path, and we can start doing this stuff. And we have, truthfully, we have been doing this stuff. You guys have been doing this stuff. Particularly when it comes to sacrifice, because you're here all the time, every week. That's a sacrifice. Right? You could be doing other stuff. So the birth is of the solar body, so we know it all automatically entails alchemy. Birth is alchemy. Self-observation and meditation are great tools, but they are not enough for the complete death of the ego. So that's why the three mounds requires alchemy. You must practice alchemy and transmutation to eliminate these aggregates. It's a must. Even if we want to eliminate our, our ego, if we want to really start eliminating ego, you have to you have to practice alchemy. That's not to be, you know, I don't want anybody to despair if we're not practicing alchemy because there's so much observation we can do, there's so much transmutation we can do before that. But to totally get rid of them, and we'll see as we climb up the mountains, to get rid of them in the, at the causal level where they first manifest, alchemy, <coughs> alchemy and transmutation is 100% necessary for that. As we eliminate the ego, we will build higher and higher bodies with the practice of alchemy. All right? And that's something we've been talking about probably for a year now. Yes. So, um, you said uh, to eliminate the ego at the, at the causal level. Mm -hmm. So is it implied that, um, is it implied that you're able to get as far as, as the causal plane in meditation without the practice of alchemy? Is that, is that kind of what what's um, being expressed? I wouldn't say that's overly implied, no. Because alchemy is definitely a necessity for accessing the causal plane too. Because you have to build a causal body. Now we don't have, we have a solar uh, astral and a solar mental, right? We don't even have, there's no such thing as a solar causal. It's only, there's only, oh sorry, there's no such thing as a lunar causal. There's only a solar causal. So we have to create that using alchemy. We'll, we'll see. As we get into the mountains, we'll go through more detail about what we're creating, what we're incarnating, and when. But, uh, I mean, we can really, you can really start eliminating them by observing them. And then pick an ego, even for a week. This is a practice that, that a lot of Gnostics don't do, even though we've been in this for, I don't know, three years, four years, ten years. Pick an ego for a week. Say, I want to work on anger. And then just honestly work on it. Look, at, look throughout the entire day. When am I angry? It doesn't just mean one day and one meditation. It means for a week. See it. Is it does it continually manifest? And what different ways does it manifest? So for one week, say, I'm working on anger, and then see where you, you end up. You'll have a, a great insight into that ego. You'll be able to even go further with it, because once you understand that ego, you understand this anger mostly is coming because of my pride. Now I'll work on that for a week, and you'll be able to understand all this. And then when you mix that with meditation, you'll go deeper and deeper into understanding this ego. And then eventually the time will come when it's time to totally eliminate that, and you'll be ready at that time. So the, the death of the ego is, is constant. The three factors are always constant. Even alchemy. Even alchemy is always constant with, with uh, retention and transmutation of the energies. We don't want to spill the energies, and we want to constantly transmute them. That's at its, at its you know, smallest scale. That's alchemy. That's the first steps of alchemy. And to do this, too, another good thing is a lot of, a lot of people in always the same way, too. They're like, well... I gotta practice alchemy because I need to, you know, eliminate these egos. So then I can go on alchemy. It's like, well, am I working on the egos of lust? No, I wasn't at the time. How are you ready for alchemy if you're not working on these egos of lust? You're not. You're just tricking yourself into thinking, okay, I'm gonna do something pure. But you're just tricking yourself to be like, oh no, it's the same old thing. Took over again, and 
I was pretending to try alchemy and it didn't work out, but maybe next time it will. If we're not working on the egos of lust, we're not ready for alchemy. That's just, that's just kind of bare bones kind of. Well, yeah, that's, that's kind of how I feel. It, it seems that a, a lot of people get lost in the idea that in order to give birth the, or to work on the factor of birth, they need to be practicing alchemy, and that's right. where usually where people either give up or they sure. discourage or their ego discourages them. Right. But I think that, that what should be emphasized a lot more, or at least through my own study, is, is uh, the, the practice of actually practicing like pranayama in yeah, the astral or something like that or in like the astral and the physical. or or the meditation on egos yeah. that that or the transformation of impressions those are all transmutation yeah, absolutely but like people absolutely. we hear alchemy right off the bat and then half of us and i was the same way i'm like well i can't do that my wife's not gonna go for that and this is not gonna happen maybe i should just quit no. that's your ego tricking you again well you we can't do that then it's all over we're saying it's not it's not by a long shot over and by the time you're eliminating these egos, and by the time you're understanding these egos and transmuting these forces, the masters are working too. Your being is working. You're, you're, you're getting a push from the monad. And in Gnosis, that's why they believe everybody's here right now. It's not just because you stumbled into it and said, oh, maybe I'll check this out. I want to get something to do every Wednesday night. Your being, your inner being, is giving you a push, compelling you to be here. That same force that's compelling you to be here is working for you right now too. It's just hard for us to feel because we don't really perceive that higher aspect of ourselves. So it's hard to say you're not alone in the work when it seems lonely, but you're not. You're the beings pushing, your, your divine mother's pushing and working for you. That's why it seems like a lot of the stories when people, you know, join join these classes, it's always sometimes an interesting story or something. You know, it's never just ah, I felt like doing something and I saw your flyer came out kind of thing. Usually people have been searching different schools for a while or they've been into spirituality for a while and then through some kind of random chance or something. Coincidence, coincidental happened, and then they end up in these studies. Well, there's forces at work we can't really perceive. And those forces continue to work. So don't feel like you're stranded because you can't be practicing alchemy immediately. It's just because we're not ready for it immediately. There's work we have to do before we're ready. And then, of course, that brings us to sacrifice. And William Blake, of course, because we love that guy. So, sacrifice must be made in order to reach the first mountain. So this is now, we're going to take a step back after this, but before we reach the, the first mountain, we have to do immense sacrifices. We will be put through many trials when we work with the three factors, as I said. Even if you just start with self-awareness, with, uh, self or just one of the factors, you're going to start having immediately tests and trials. You're going to be like, hey, you know what, I'm just going to try meditating for 10 minutes every night. And then when you sit down to meditate, that's when the phone rings, or the kids start bugging you, or someone drops by to visit, or... It becomes hard. It's like the simple things become hard because there is the opposing force working against you. Now your being's pushing you forward, but nothing is given for free. Everything has to be earned. And that's why trials aren't a bad thing. And that's why Lucifer is also the light bearer in esoteric schools. He's the light bearer because it's through the, and we'll get into that too, but through the temptations of Lucifer is your virtue tested and proven and then you move on. But if the devil, say we'll go like we'll go common terminology, if the devil tempted you, all he did was give you a choice and you chose the wrong one, did the devil make you do it or did you choose the wrong choice when the, when the, when the time was at hand? You know, you could say, I'm a good person, I wouldn't hurt anybody, and then you go out and you drink and someone pushes you and you get in a fight. Like, oh, well, I don't usually hurt anybody, but it's easy to say that when you're standing in a room full of nice people. But when the situation is when you're provoked and you end up hurting people, that's a choice you made based on the situation that was presenting itself. It's not. That's why you know some. Uh, I'm not gonna harp on anybody, but that's why the devil made me do it isn't a good uh, isn't a good defense. You know, people say a demon made him do it because all there really is is choices, and you can choose to listen to your lower nature or your higher nature. And this choice is happening every second. It's happening right now. Every day you you have a choice. You're making choices every day. And the choice to do the good is a sacrifice. Because it doesn't seem easy or as worthwhile at the time because it's easier to do nothing. And it's easier to, you know, it's easier to be lazy and be like, ah, oh, you know, I'm going to start meditating, but maybe I'll do it tomorrow. You know, that happens to all of us. That's a choice you just made. You didn't, you didn't say, I'm going to start meditating tomorrow. You said, I'm not going to meditate today. That's the choice you made. And we got, if you start looking at it that way, you realize, wow, I make a lot of these choices every day. And we all do it. You know, I do it. We all do it. There's choices. And that's what... And that's what these trials are that we're talking about. Sometimes it's not always going to be a guardian on the threshold appears and says, you have to fight me and then you can go on. 
It's gonna be little, it's gonna be little, right? It's gonna be little trials. You know, I'm an honest person, but then somebody dropped their wallet and like, well, I might not yell at them to see what's in there and then, you know, finders keepers, that's a thing, right? No, it's not a thing. <laughs> that's a bad choice is what it is. It's just you choosing the wrong thing. So, I mean, and like we always say, you can generally tell when you're doing the wrong thing when you're justifying it in your mind. Oh, that guy had nice clothes on. He probably doesn't need this money. I need it more than him because, you know, I'm going to school. And, uh, you, you can justify anything. But we will be <coughs> continually tested as we do this path, as you have been already, and as we will be continually, continually tested. We must pass on what we have learned in order to advance. This is part of the sacrifice for humanity, passing on the information. That's why Gnostic instructors do it, and that's why everything's done for free. It's not because there's a hook or a scam ever, but it's because this is fundamental like, in the Gnostic system. To, to, you, have, to, you have to give in order to receive. And it doesn't mean everyone has to be an instructor. It means like, you know, helping friends out. And, and, it, and it, gets, it gets hard, I've found, personally. It gets hard because you, you don't, not, not hard, but I, you want to walk this line of, okay, I want to help people, and I don't want to become a megalomania and think that I know everything, so here I am on the podium telling you how life is, right? So you're just trying to pass on the teachings of Samael, and you're trying to do it humbly, and you're trying to do a good job. Or you can just help people in life, regular life, sacrificing. You know, you have friends that are having a hard time, you can maybe gently point them to one of Samael's books, or you could gently point out that maybe some of their suffering is caused by their own internal psychological states. But I mean, at the same time, we always have to do this with a fine line, because we're not trying to be judgmental, we're trying to be helpful. And sometimes people don't like that. And that's a sacrifice for humanity right, that we've been talking about. Um, the three factors are the only path to liberation. And notice they're, they're adamant about this. These are the only paths to liberation. The birth, death, and sacrifice. And that's how we even remember we did occult schools or, and pseudo-occult schools or esoteric schools and pseudo-esoteric. Pseudo-esoterics always had one or two of the three factors. And then black Black magic schools had none, or they taught the opposite. It wasn't just like, we don't like these guys, they're bad because they're evil. It's like, no, they're not teaching the factors, and you have to be taught the three factors or you're not going to be able to ascend to the absolute. There are other paths, but the Gnostic path is the path of the razor's edge, direct to the absolute. And that's what, that's what we consider li liberation. So if you're missing those factors, then it's, 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 you're not doing anybody a favor by passing on that teaching. When we begin working with the three keys, we become subje uh, subjected to tests and trials. And we just talked about that in the last slide. This happens in the physical and in the astral. It can be physical tests like we were talking about with the wallets or with the fight, or and in the astral especially. You might notice you start having weird dreams. Maybe you have a dream that someone you know is making fun of you. And you're like, I don't understand. This is ridiculous. And you get mad or you can have all kinds of dreams that when you look back, you're like, oh, maybe that was a test to see what my state of mind was at. And I reacted violently when I should have been serene. And this is the, my, my you know, subconscious working. And even though I'm working on these egos of anger, I had a dream where someone made me angry and I fought them. And uh, in the physical, I'm like, no, oh, peace. That's peace and love, man. And then in the astral, right back to my animal nature. So these tests, they get subtle. Sometimes it can be very obvious, and sometimes it can be very subtle, very, very subtle tests. Especially in the astral when it comes to dreams. Yes? Does it have to be a lucid dream, or can nope. it just be a regular dream? It can be a regular dream, and most of them can be remembered, like, fragment, fragmented, like a regular dream. Yeah. Right. Well, what if we're, we kill someone because we're protecting a loved one now? Well, there's, there's lots of different circumstances, for yeah. sure. Lots of different variables. I wouldn't personally be, I wouldn't cast judgment on anybody, because no, no, it's no. a hard path for everybody to no, walk, so yeah, if we I kill know. somebody from protecting somebody, I mean, there, there's different laws of karma. Yeah. If someone's killing, I don't know. I mean, that's a tricky dream, question. Right? But oh, I in mean, a dream. Like, okay, that's easy. In a dream. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm like, oh, you kill somebody. It's cool. I'm saying you're dreaming that yeah. you kill somebody sure. because you, you think they're going to kill a loved one. Right, people. sure. Then, yeah, yeah. Is that a test as well, maybe? It's all tests. The entire time you'll be lots of tests. I mean, in. There's been different dreams, and I've had dreams I, I could tell were tests, and I woke up in the morning, like, oh, that was a test, and I failed. And the same thing happened <laughs> when, like, when my friends came running out and said, stop that guy, I'm like, okay, so I had a gun, and I shot him, stop him, I'm like, okay, I stopped him. So and he, my friend told me to, so I didn't, and I woke up, I'm like, oh, man. I, I realize now I just, in my dream, 
yeah. killed somebody that I didn't know why, just because someone told me to in a, <laughs> in a problem that I wasn't even involved in, so I think I failed the test there. Yeah, you know, but I think I failed the test too. Yeah. I'm just assuming you're going to kill Yeah. You know, you're yeah. going to kill somebody else. And the tests can be intricate and they can be subtle. Yes. And, you can be, and even when you fail it, you could learn something because yeah. you're not really going to be failing tests until we're like on the probative path and on the the mountains, right? Okay, so, so these I mean, little tests. We're going to be working. They're, they're yeah. not going to, we could, we could get tested again. Oh, you yeah. Know, just because we flunked the first yeah. one. We're gonna, as we're long gonna, as you're working the three factors, or any portion of the three factors, you're going to be <laughs> tested. Mm -hmm. so maybe we can learn that we have in, in our subconscious, in yeah. our depth, we have those yeah. egos Absolutely. of, of yeah. murder. Yeah. Even if we don't kill people in the physical, mm -hmm. but we have inside sure. those egos. Sure. You work on lust all day long and you think, I've got it under control, then you have a really lustful dream. Like, well, that exists still in you. It's still in there. Yeah. And like, the propensity to murder is that the yeah, yeah, same idea. Like, there's that violent aspect that's still in there. Or the maybe subconscious it's just level. that anger towards that person that you haven't dealt with. Sure. Sure. I mean, that that will be a test also, but at the same time, yeah, yeah you, can, you can still learn. Yeah. You can still learn a lot from that. So. Um, nothing, like we said, is given for free, but must, everything must be earned on the Gnostic path. That's why we're tested. You must be found worthy to proceed. Um, and persistence is necessary. We have to constantly persist, and we have to be found worthy, and we're constantly going to be tested. The good part is that you've already been put through many trials and tests, right? To end up where you are now, on the Gnostic path. Even here where we are now, in phase C, you've been put through a lot of of many, many trials and many, many tests. Sometimes it's subconsciously, we don't even understand that we've been put through tests, but being on this Gnostic path automatically guarantees that you've gone through tests to even be here. So it's not like you have all these tests coming up that you're not gonna be able to handle, because you've handled them so far. You're all here on the path. Your, being, your being's working for you, the Divine Mother's working for you. You know, the Gnostic group's here. You've been tested, you're still here, you know. Like I said, when I came through Phase C, it whittled down to maybe two out of a bigger group than what you guys were. Not that that was special or anything, but it's just that it shows you that some people, over time, will maybe their minds will go elsewhere and they'll find something else to do, and they can't handle the test. There are lots of tests. I mean. And I think we are lucky because a long time ago, this knowledge was not like this. Yeah. You have to fight. Yeah. A lot to get it. For sure. You have yeah. to go through different tasks in the physical world yeah. to be able to receive the knowledge, to yeah. be able to receive the, the mysteries of the great arcana yeah, and, sure. and all of this. So we are yeah. lucky. And some now unveiled it, so it makes the most sense to us now. I mean, in a way that we can understand it. I mean, we've seen, if you studied other systems and even just minor systems, I say even Freemasonry, you guys had a lecture on that. You can see there's stuff in there that's so hidden and so veiled that. 99.99% of all those people aren't going to really understand this stuff because just the way it's been degenerated or preserved and hidden and veiled. And it was like that always in the past. And like you remember uh, Ed's lecture where he talked about Jesus and what it meant when, when the curtain was ripped from the temple. And it says that in the Bible when he died on the cross and the curtain was ripped from the temple. Now you see the initiation process, but even even with that statement, we're like, whoa, where, where was it? We didn't see it. We kind of miss it. That was the whole story of the Christ, right? So, and we're going to get there, too. So we'll keep going. So we'll just do a... I forgot you guys got the probative path, honestly. So we'll just do a quick review of it. Yeah. So we can begin working on the probative path immediately by balancing the five centers. This is going to be on the test also, the five centers. So that's why I put this in there. But we're going to have a whole class of test review stuff. We balance the five centers. What? But you're going to be tested? Oh, yeah, there's a test coming up. <laughs> I'm not good at tests. It's okay. I'll tell you right now. I'm going to It's, it's fine. There is, no, there is no fail. Get that out of your mind. Get that out of your mind. No, I'm not. Yeah, there you go. I'm going to be positive. You're going to be fine. You are going to pass. No matter what mark you get. I guarantee you, you're going to pass. Okay? Is it self-awareness? Is self-observation the same thing? Yeah, they're linked. Yeah. Self-awareness is the first step of it, right? First being present in, like, say, in the room. And then observing what you're doing, what you're thinking, is the next step uh, of self-awareness. Remember, self-awareness, self-observation, reflection, elimination, all sort of different steps of the same so thing. So those words are going to be on it? Uh, I don't know about these words. The five centers and where they're located will be on it. Oh, okay. The five right? centers. Okay. Yeah, that's it. We'll, go, we'll go over the test. Don't, don't, don't anybody worry about the test right now. <laughs> you have lots of time before the test. Uh, we can purify the sexual energies. 
uh, through transmutation, mineralization, and then eventually alchemy. You know, so we can start. This is what's going to start the probative path. Transmutation. That would be. Um... Like the pranayama is that kind of okay. thing. Okay. I'm talking about okay. pranayamas, hamsas. Um, that won't get you all the way to creating all the golden bodies or anything like that, or the solar bodies. I mean, sorry, but uh, it's a good start to start purifying all this stuff. Yes. It'll awaken more consciousness, give you more power to work with, more tools. And that's what it really does. Okay, so the probate of path, as we talked about earlier, consists of. Guardian of the threshold. You guys talked about that. I think we'll go over it briefly again. That happens in the astral, the mental, and the causal plane. You're going to meet a guardian. Then you have the four tests, the tests of the elements, so fire, air, water, earth, and then the eight minor initiations, sometimes nine, and then there's major initiations also, but we don't, we're not going to get into that stuff as much. And that is from... Yeah. Uh, guardian of the threshold, what do you think the, the astral, mental, and causal plane? There's going to be a guardian of the threshold on each one of those planes, and we're going to talk about them right now. Oh, okay. So we'll get right into it. And then we go to the three mountains from there, where the three factors are. A necessity, not just something we're trying to work towards, but something we're actively working with. Just like Jeffrey. <laughs> there it is. There. So, the guardian of the threshold, we'll talk about briefly. There's a button under, under the uh, mouse tab on oh, the yeah. board. Uh, Either side, uh, right the, side. The, the arrow pointing down. That one. This one? Yep. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Okay. The guardian is a reflection of the eye. So the guardian, although it seems external, do you guys remember this stuff? Is this with you or did we get into this stuff? Yeah. Keep going. Okay. The guardian is a reflection of the eye. All right. Of our ego? Of our ego. Of our own subconscious psychological aggregates. It is the ugly living mirror of all our evil deeds. So it's a personification of, of the worst of us that exists within us. Oh, okay. The first guardian we encounter in the astral, and Samuel talks about it being a hand-to-hand -hand battle in the internal worlds. When you have a victory, or you, he talks about like there's an electric storm that happens in the astral when you invoke it, and this horrible creature shows up that's the reflection of all your... Uh, egos, uh, egos of desire, right? Because we're in the astral plane. So it's e you fight your egos of desire. Personified by this one hideous creature called the guardian of the threshold. It's the threshold of the, of the astral plane. Is there plane. always an electrical storm? He's, he says there is for the three guardians. Yeah. It's always mm -hmm. preceded by that. And then when, when you ha have victory over it, you go to a place called the children's chamber. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. Children's chamber is, that, is in, the, in the internal world where the, the children would be the initiates on the path. So where you're going, and then the masters receive you, and they have a great celebration for you when you, when, you over, when you complete that. If you get defeated by the guardian of the threshold in the astral, it equals being enslaved by your passions, your vices on the astral level, your emotions. I mean, you'll continue to be, be tested, but if you fail that, that guardian of the threshold, you'll go back down to being have a lot of egos, of passion, and, and vice that way. Next we have the, the second guardian. This is on the mental plane now. More terrible than the previous guardian, right? Mm -hmm. That's because the egos of the mind are more terrible than the egos of feelings. And again, we have, to, we have to fight this guardian of the threshold in the superior dimensions. And if we are victorious, we go to this children's chamber again for all initiates, where they're received by masters of the White Lodge. And if we get defeated, it means that we'll be enslaved you know, by the egos of the mind, the intellect. And I am going pretty quick through this, but I know this is a little bit of review. But if you have questions, we can stop. Review. Review. It's like the first time I've seen this. Is it? Memories. Okay, well, we can talk more about it. We can talk more about it. Okay. This was the, uh, this was in phase B. It was, no, was, the I lecture was called. The phase B stuff. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. phase B stuff. Yeah, I just remember that. It's all good, we can talk about it. We don't, oh, we gotta be tonight. I've had a long time ago then. Huh? It's, 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 it's been quite a while ago. Sure. But yeah. I don't remember children's chamber. I think children's okay. chamber just means that you're... The children's chamber is, and this is, this is constant throat Gnosticism. The children aren't actual children. It's initiates. So when Jesus said, let the children come to me, he's talking about let the initiates on the path. It doesn't mean little kids. 
No. Same with oh. anyone who, who makes the children go astray. It's better that they you know, put a chain around their neck and a stone and cast themselves in the ocean. He's talking about the initiates. If you, if you take the initiates and make them stray off the path. He's not talking about actual little children when oh, we okay. interpret it gnostically. Oh. So a children's chamber would be like for, if you, you know, defeat, I'll get to you in a minute. When you defeat the guardian of the th threshold in the astral, then you'll go there, not as a child or anything, but just no. that you're a child because you're initiated initiate. on the path. Um, so, I'm assuming that he wrote very little about this. In in the book, uh, The Three Mountains, he, he wrote more extensively on this. On, I, on the uh, Guardian Guardians of the Threshold. Threshold. Also, maybe not The Three Mountains, it's, it's 100% in the initiation of... Hold on, it's, it's in the perfect matrimony for sure. Definitely in there. Oh, I got that. Yeah. I, that's where I got most of the information about this Probeto path. It's also in the initiation of the... Cabal and the Tarot, that book, talks about it. Okay. And the Three Mountains, he talks the about it. The one I have about death, the Gnostic book of death, I think it's in Yeah. Do you think that um, the the descriptions that Samuel uh, provided can uh, could possibly be interpreted symbolically rather than literal? Like actually seeing yeah. an electrical storm? Well, yeah. to, to him, example. he bases it on his personal experience that he went through. And that's what he wrote it out of. So. It could be archetypal, and it could be symbolic, because remember, you're in the astral plane now when this happens. So everything in the astral is working on the, on the language of symbols. We're already in that plane of existence where everything's symbolic, right? So it could be symbolic also. But he does talk about fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat, the starting the threshold that is your ego. It's reminiscent of Star Wars, when he goes into the cave and he fights Darth Vader and he cuts his head off and it's his face there. That's sort of what George Lucas was going for, I think. <laughs> Yes. Um, do you think as, um, as initiates or people that are interested in, um, in uh, the path of initiation, do you think that it's a worthwhile to try to, um, like well, let's say we, we become aware or lucid, we're in a dream, mm -hmm. or we, we achieve astral projection through meditation, mm -hmm. do you think that it's worthwhile to try to um, uh, make these things happen? Like to think while you're in the astral, oh, like, yeah. like sh I want to experience, I want to experience the first guardian yeah. or something like that. Do you think that that's required, or do you think that that's something that our our uh, inner being provides us yeah. given the circumstance? Right. I, I think what's most important in the astral, whenever you have an experience, is to invoke the divine mother, and and pray in, in veneration of the divine mother and ask her where you need to go. I think. Maybe if you if you like, had like 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 us, you get a quick glimpse and then they ask a lucid dream. Okay, all right, guardian on the threshold, let's go. I want to do this before I fall back into sleep. I think it might it's not going to be what we think it is. I think our being will lead us there, like you said in the second part, which I think is more likely to happen. He says somebody else says you invoke them, but you invoke them when you're ready, for sure. And you know you're when you're ready because you're you're you know talking with your divine mother and you're asking her, show me where I need to be. So if any if any time you find yourself in the astral, and, and I had a lot of you know experiences that didn't work out too well, because when I was first doing, it, I was in the astral, and like, hey, uh, I want to you know see uh, uh, talk to Wolfgang or Lee or something like that. It's like, well, what you should be doing is Divine Mother, where do I need to be? Where do I need to go? And then you know that whatever is going to happen, it's more it's more impacting because that's what you're supposed to see at that time. You can't really force the issue. Yeah. Have an astral experience, okay? I'm going. You know what? Forget these other guys. Guardian of the Threshold, Calzo World, let's go. Let's jump a couple steps. <laughs> <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> doesn't work like that. Let's so. get it on here. It is important to you. <laughs> Always remember your mother. And Samael talked about this extensively because for a long time, they're like, you're forgetting your mother and he couldn't go. He's like, you're forgetting your mother. He couldn't get any further. So he'd find his, his physical mother who had passed away in the astral plane. He's like, hey, I found her. No, that's not it. What is it? What am I forgetting? We're talking about the Divine Mother. Never forget the Divine Mother. That's why it's always good to do meditations on the Divine Mother, venerative kind of meditation, so that when you're in the astral, and you actually say, oh, D Divine Mother, please help me, that's when it's more felt, because you're in the astral, you can maybe perhaps see your Divine Mother, or experience something that's brought on by your Divine Mother, and it's what you need when you need it, basically. So I, know, I don't want it to be like a cheesy blanket answer, like just ask your Divine Mother, but she is, she is the link between yourself and this path that you're doing. So always remember your divine mother. Yes. So and to extend your answer, sure. um, uh, with a follow-up question, 
um, then would you say the the whole path is almost like that? We we more so are we do our work and we if we do arrive at the astral mm -hmm. we we invoke the divinities and they'll guide us is, sure. is that the idea sure. rather than trying yeah. to initiate ourselves right because your beings your beings receiving the initiations and when you incarnate the being then it's like hey now i'm receiving them because you're becoming in tune with the being but the initiations are for the being so what we're working to do is become in tune with the being by incarnating the being in these bodies and by doing to do that we have to work on the ego to do that we have to sacrifice so that's why the three factors come in basically it, it doesn't work any other way I mean, we have. We can't judge where we're at in the path, basically, if we don't remember, we don't know our name, we don't know the being. We can't say, okay, I think I'm ready. I think I'm ready for the guardian of the astral world. But how do I know? What am I basing that on? Do I remember any other trials? You know, I don't know. So always, always look to the mother for sure. And the third guardian is in the council, and that's the most terrible of all the guardians. And that's in the world of the will. Anybody recognize what these three guardians also represent? Anything else we've talked about? That what these three guardians actually represent? We've got the astral, the mental, the council. Anything? You got an idea? The, uh, the astral would be the emotions. Yep. Uh, the, the mental would be the mind. Yep. And the council would be the spirit? Um, it's, it's the will. It's the, the three will. traitors. Okay. These, are, yep. these are the three traitors, right? Oh. We have the demon of desire. We have, you know... The demon of ill will is the worst one, and then the, the demon that washes its hands, the demon of the mind. So what the three traitors represent are these three guardians, too. So, the so just something. Is the demon of the demon desire. Of desire. It's the Judas. Demon Remember, of Judas desire, represents. The demon of the mind. The demon, the demon of the mind was Pilate. Remember, washing his hands, justifying yes. himself. And ill will was Caiaphas, because he knew that Jesus was what he said he was, but he still condemned him anyways. So these, these are reminiscent of the three traitors, and they had those traits. So when we're fighting this demon, it's, it's that idea. When we're fighting this demon, it's, it's the, the, the idea of the mental, you know, stuff that we always wash our hands of. So, I mean, this stuff keeps coming around in cycles, and it's all related. And it all culminates basically in this, because this is the, the entirety of the work. Okay, and victory equals the, the children's chamber again. Each time there's the masters of the White Lodge and everything. Like this. Um, and defeat equals enslavement. By the by, the ill will, and that's the uh, and that's just, uh, that's briefly the guardians of the threshold. So that's all we're going to cover in this one. But there is more, like we said, in phase B. If you want to go back to those lectures, the four tests are the tests of the elements. Uh, the candidate faces four ordeals in the super sensitive worlds. The ordeals of the elements push the ego to the surface. That way, they can be seen and eliminated. This is what these ordeals are mainly meant to do. They bring the ego to the surface is all they're doing. They're not being mean to you or anything. They're just bringing your own egos to the surface so you can see them and hopefully overcome them. So the test of fire, this is the idea of, of the dreams or tests in the ass where, we ha where you're, you're being persecuted and you're being, people are insulting you. And this tests your serenity and sweetness. It says the wrathful and the choleric always fail. So this would be like if you have dreams or even... They don't have to be dreams. They can be dreams, but they can be conscious astral experiences or lucid dreams where people are hurling insults at you. And if you're getting mad, then that's a test. And you're, you're proving to yourself that there's still too much wrath or anger inside of yourself to, to, to go further on the path. And until you can deal with that and find those egos and eliminate them, you're going to maybe be stuck there. But, but what it does is forces you to realize that so that you won't be stuck there. Yes? I never have dreams like that. I'm just always okay. wandering around and looking at things sure. or, or doing things, mm -hmm. but I never have um, any kind of tests like where I'm Well, going a lot of the time we don't remember, too, because we, we have to work on our, con our consciousness, too. Mm -hmm. You could be getting tested in the internal worlds right now heavily, be, and you won't remember. To be angry. Yeah, but I don't have nightmares. I don't mm -hmm. have anything where I... Sure. Like no. these people. It's a, it's a, it is a separation Murder of consciousness. Murder and all this stuff. I, I'm missing out. <laughs> no, you don't miss it. No, you just don't remember. It's because we're not aware. Well, we don't remember it. It's because we're not aware. We don't remember your dreams. <laughs> I, yes, I but do. we have to remember that it's not only in the internal wars. It can, you can be tested in the physical. That's right. Also, like we said. With yeah. insults, yeah. people insulting you. Well, yes. I don't think physical stuff is so, easy to see. Yes. Not right. only in the right. internal world. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, we don't have to think. Good point, Doris. We don't have to think that this is going to happen in the internal worlds only and then we're going to pass and go to this children's chamber. 
The idea is that you can be tested in the physical as well as the astral, mm -hmm. or vice versa. Maybe you don't get this test in the astral because it's in the physical. Someone you know starts insulting you, or someone you, doesn't, you don't even know starts insulting you. That's a test. I've noticed that in the last week, like people in sales, like in the stores, okay. like they seem to have no no time. They can't be bothered. Like they're mm -hmm. just. And I thought, well, these people are being paid to you know to serve the public, and yet they. I sort of wonder if the the boss really saw how they interact. Yeah. If they would still be at and that can job. Test they it, can you test for your surrender? I know to be. <laughs> sweet to be yeah. Try not, not to get frustrated at this. To, I, I, yeah. I was going to tell this one woman on the phone at the doctor's office. The woman, I thought, you know. I really was that close to telling her that yeah. she shouldn't be so, uh, you know. Yeah, you need to take a step back and maybe collect yourself and say, maybe this is a test. You just let it go because it's still Because the other thing about the initiation, which I didn't mention, but your life is the initiation. Life is the initiation. You've been initiated into life. But shouldn't you tell those life people? Life gives you all these initiations. So if you're living, you're going through it, everybody's getting initiated. Most people aren't aware, and they're just feeling, 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 feeling at these initiations, so they don't go further in consciousness. But life is the initiation. It's not all going to happen in some super serene, heaven kind of astral plane place. Life is the initiation. And we're being initiated here constantly. When we pass, we get more consciousness. The initiation of air is we're thrown into a precipice. You know, this is like an astral idea. Those who are not willing to lose what they love most always fail. So it doesn't mean that we can be physically thrown to a precipice, but it might be that we're going to lose a loved one, and if we can't deal with that or handle it, or we're not willing, that's the same test. That's the same test. And the asshole maybe you're actually thrown into a, a precipice, and if you scream out because you, you're cherishing your life and everything too much you're going to miss, then you'll fail. In real life, you know, pe we lose people all the time. Everyone's lost family members. Everybody loses people that they love the most sometimes. And the idea is that this can also be a test. If we just wallow in misery and pain because of that, it's, it's the constant, maybe we haven't, we haven't passed that test yet because we haven't recognized it as a test. So this test happens all the time in the physical. It's not just an astral thing. Thanks for pointing that out for us. I was overlooking it. Um, then there's a test of water. This, is, this can happen in a dream or in the astral. It's drowning in water, in the ocean. Those who reject the struggle of life and prefer to die always fail. So, I mean, that sort of goes hand in hand with the test of air and life. But if we have a hard time, we say, you know what, I'm just going to give up and be depressed and stay home and shut myself out. That's, that's failing a test of life. And people do it. We're not judging people. But we're saying now we're aware that life is giving us tests that we can choose to meet head on and overcome. So what we're trying to do here is test our attachment to other things. What we're trying to do here is to attach, test um, how we react to the situations of life. Everyone knows that life isn't easy, and Plato even said you should be kind to everybody because it's a hard path they're on no matter who they are, right? Everybody's going through these tests. And this is what makes life hard, but when you realize that they could be tests and that there's gems of wisdom in passing these tests, then it gives it more meaning, more depth, a little more depth, as opposed to just being like, why me? Why is this happening to me? I'll tell you why, because it's happening to everybody, and you're part of everybody. We're all going through this stuff. Then there's the test, yes. Um, so, with the with the example you provided, yes. I'm curious to know what your opinion is in regards to, you know, let's say we're witnessing someone mm -hmm. that's going through a test, but they're True. not aware mm -hmm. that it's happening, mm -hmm. um, and we feel we feel like we we need to tell them, like, well, listen, maybe maybe you know you can handle it a better way or something mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but how does, how does that all work into karma and messing with sure. people's free will? Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, like we said, it's a very, very fine line. If you want to help somebody, you have to make sure it's coming from a genuine place of help. A lot of the times we want to help people, we want to maybe show off how much we know. Subconsciously, maybe we don't think that's what we're doing, or maybe we want to, maybe it makes us feel better because we're in a, be a better position than this person. Like, listen, this happened to me, and I handled it way better. This is what I did. Sometimes that's not going to help that person. So be like, get out of here. You know, what are you doing? I'm so happy for you, but I'm miserable. So the idea is that we're supposed to be, try and be humble. You always have to be humble. You always have to try and be genuine. It's hard. It is hard. And uh, I found with, with myself when I do this stuff, I always overthink things. And then uh, I start stumbling on my words because I'm like, I want to say something. like, ah, I'm going to say it. I don't know. What am I being, what am I being like over analytical? So, I mean, you can go that way too, which is not helpful at all, right? 
And if you want to be helpful, make sure it comes from a place of sacrifice. And it is hard when you see people going through troubles. Basically, what you can do is comfort them and gently, gently, if the time, if, it, if something comes up, you can start guiding them little by little. But if you say, listen, you're having a hard time because uh, your wife just left, left you. Listen, it's just a test. So just be cool. We're not gonna, you know, you can't just lay it on them. They'll tell you something else. Yeah, yeah. You know, so there is, there is a fine line. It's better to help with this knowledge from from knowing this knowledge than it is to try and unload the knowledge onto somebody. This is just my opinion, by the way. That's not what someone else said. And yes. also, you know, some people want to control the OP. Oh, don't do it my way, sure. and it's the wrong way. Sure, sure. I mean, you have those people too yeah. that are very controlling, you know, and yeah. that's not. Yeah. You know, so remember, our egos problem. are always present. That's right. Until we know the name, and not even know the name, but feel that we are the Father who's in secret, then there's ego there. So you almost—it's almost like you can't trust yourself, even. But we do have to help people. We have to sacrifice for them. So I would suggest help them as best as you can, without being forceful without being overbearing, without being judgmental. Be very careful of your personality. I say be, be warm, be comforting. And I don't know, it's it's a tough question, I know, because we're always trying to walk that line. And we're human at the same time. So it is going to come over. We are going to be like, it's okay, they're there. You know, you might just be going through tests and you can handle it better. Say, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said it like that. But we're human and we're trying to help, right? So we're working on ourselves, <coughs> working for sacrifice too. That's the best advice I can give in that situation for my own self. Oh, we didn't talk about Earth yet. Okay, so the, so the um, test of Earth, in the astral you can feel like you're between two mountains that are closing in on you. He says those who uh, succumb to pain, uh, well those who scream out will fail in the asshole kind of thing, but those who succumb to the pain before the adversities of life always fail. So the idea, if, if, if all these situations in your life that are happening, all these negative situations, these bad situations, if, they, if you just succumb to pain in the face of adversity, then you're not going to pass this one. We have to realize that adversity is the best opportunity to, to realize our egos. It's the best mirror for us to realize our egos. This is the, the remember the gymnasium, the training ground, the psychological gymnasium is life. This is, this is the psychological gymnasium. We have a hard time. We're supposed to be somewhere and our car breaks down and just you start swearing and losing your mind and everything. So <laughs> let's not... This is, this, is, this is just the adversities of life, and you're going to have to face this with serenity and calmness. Because what else can you do? It's a test. Life is a test. And it is symbolic in the higher realms as being two mountains closing in. Because that's what these tests can feel like in the physical, too. Because all these problems surmounting, and you don't know which way to go on either. And it's just like, ah, get me out of here. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to go back to being shut in the room again. <laughs> Put on some crandles and watch it front to back. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> So, moving on, I think I'm just going to retire this guy. <laughs> Morphine works too. <laughs> uh, works as a joke, maybe. <laughs> but in reality, not so much. <laughs> reality is going to add to your problems. You're going to mask. You're going to mask the cause. That's just masking symptoms. My cousin had surgery last week because they gave her more pain. Sure. pain. It's a painkiller for physical pain. Yeah. But it's not going to help you in the test. Any kind of then there's the eight minor initiations, nine sometimes. Uh, depends on which exact book you read. Um, when the candidate has completed the introductory ordeals of the path, they are enter the minor mysteries. So this is the minor mysteries now we're talking about. And that, those are, the, well, we just talked about the guardians of the threshold and the element, the, the test of the elements. Those are the introductory ordeals. So we can see what kind of path we're on here. It's definitely a lot of work. But these are a <coughs> sorry. These are attained with the conscious of the innermost. Mm -hmm. uh, the innermost consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's what we have to remember. That's what we're talking about. That's why there's like a separation. Okay, why maybe so, we can't remember. Yes. So Phil, so the first part is, is more or less to recognize your ego. And to, you're battling your egos. Yep. You're definitely battling your egos. And you're, you're getting rid of the egos. And in order to see your, um, yeah. your innermost consciousness, you have to first get rid of your ego. Yeah, we have to work on the egos first. That's the first step. We're not even eliminating all these egos no. that we're facing here. We're just, we're just becoming aware of them, and we're knowing what to look for and this kind of thing. But we must work on awareness so that we can remember the initiation in the superior world. So this is what we were talking about a little bit. Like, if we can't remember our dreams or anything, we just have to, we have to start working more on awareness. Dream recollection, the dream diary, you know, 
Everybody remember uh, the key of salt? You guys remember the key of salt? No. That would be on the test. No. The key right. of salt. Subject, object, location. You remember this? No. This is an awareness exercise. The subject is you. The object is what you're looking at. The location is where are you. This is this is the keys to start becoming aware. We'll go over it. We'll go over it again. Yeah. That's part of the awareness. It's called the key of salt. Subject, object, location. Um, yeah. We must learn to project consciously. That's another big thing. That's why we're always doing the dream diaries. That's why we're working at astral projection. Because astral projection in the skill of itself is can be used really touristy. We know that. It's not the be all and the end all. But that's the skill that's going to allow us to remember what's going on in the superior worlds. When we start astral projecting and using those techniques. Uh, and these initiations are specific to each individual, as I said. So we're not really going to go into those. I don't think I got. I don't think I learned the the major initiations either, because this was just supposed to be kind of an overview of the probate of path. Um, the probate of path is for the candidate who is on trial. So now we're candidates for the three mountains. Basically, we're initiates. We're working in the three factors, or partially with different aspects of them. So we're put to trial. That's what the probate of path is. It's all a big trial. Once the probate of path is completed, we begin working on the three mountains. So that's a, that's a large body of work that we have to complete before we get to the three mountains. But it's necessary, and it happens continually, because we are, like we said, continually being tested right now. Um, now we'll get into the actual three mountains themselves here. So this is the three mountains. That's basically what it looks like. There's the mountain of initiation. That's the first mountain. The mountain of resurrection is the second mountain. And the mountain of ascension is the third mountain. Uh, and at the end, it leads to the absolute. The absolute is generally shown like this in a lot of different cultures, the point within the circle. I think you guys went over that with, with the lecture last week, too. Even. So there are eight initiations on each, or some eight specific ones that Samuel talks about in his book, The Three Mountains. And we'll do a brief overview of each mountain, too. Right now. There's eight initiations for each mountain? For each mountain. Oh, my God. But there's another work that has to be done also before this. Jeez, that's a lot. I'm going to need another one. Well, this is, yeah. this is, happens over many lives. Five or six. Yeah. And you had it completed this. This had been completed at one time, remember? At one time you had completed this already. I'll start when I'm Before you fell, you were, you, were, you were there. Now we have to work harder to get back there. They are called mountains, like I said, because we have to climb them step by step. All these initiations, all these trials, it's step by step process. It is a difficult climb. The first two mountains have peaks upon which we can rest before we start the next one. I mentioned that earlier. And the third mountain leads directly to the Absolute from its summit. It's the idea that you would ascend right into the Absolute. We'll look at that a little further. So let's talk about the first mountain, the Mountain of Initiation. The first mountain, like we said, is the Mountain of Initiation. To start the first mountain, the initiate must be working with all three factors, all three keys. So we talked about this earlier. Before that, you know, it's not as important, but we have to be working with the three factors to be on trial in the first place. Another thing that is maybe important to mention now, too, is that people who are working in alchemy with a partner will go through the probate of path quicker because they're having this extra energy. People who won't will go through it slower, but it's still it's not that it's impossible. But the idea of working in alchemy with a partner always makes the work quicker because you're utilizing two energies instead of one. Instead of just your own. So, I mean, alchemy is, an, is definitely an important thing. I don't want to understate its importance either, because I do always tend to say no. We can do a lot without it, but it is extremely important. Especially if we want to begin the mountains. We have to be working in alchemy to, to enter the first mountain. Uh, the Kundalini rises up the spine. A little bit of spine. Rise. Rise up the Rise. spine. Rise up. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of... That's the, that's the gangster terminology there. <laughs> Kundalini rise up the spine, son. <laughs> and this happens vertebrae by vertebrae. And there's 33 vertebrae, right? So we, and you guys talked about that also with the Masonic lecture, I believe. Um, there is a test for each vertebrae. Each vertebrae as it rises, there's a test. Samuel talks about this one. The initiate must raise the serpent seven times. And you have to do this seven times. Seven times, yeah. 
The Kundalini rises up the spine seven times. On each vertebra? <laughs> 231 <laughs> times. Oh my God. You have to raise it in the physical, for the physical body, the etheric, the astral, the mental, the causal, the buddhic, and the atmic. You have to do this on each mountain also. On each mountain? On each mountain. You raise the serpent seven times. How long is it supposed to take it? It takes a long time. Yeah. Yeah. The idea is with, with the teachings and with the words of Samuel, you can reach enlightenment in one lifetime. But that is also yeah, a difficult task. A super difficult task. But the idea is we can get very far. And we already believe in the transmigration of the soul. We know the work we have done previously carry with us. It's one on any strain of work. Yes. One, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you very quote. much previously. I'm <laughs> 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 not much coming back. <laughs> Back. Oh, well, one, one really interesting quote I heard um, <laughs> that maybe will help uh, everyone in the room who thinks it's a, a long path is, is actually somebody all, uh, said, someone asked him, uh, like, why is the path so long? Yeah. Well, and his response was, it isn't. It isn't, yeah. It's just hard. It's just hard, yeah. And the reason that people perceive it as something that's long is just it's just their ego. Sure. Um, really, in actuality, it's just oh. the you could like you could like they were saying you, you can do it really fast. It's right. just most people don't have that sure. much will. Exactly. And the other thing is you're going to have 108 lives as a human. Does that seem like a short amount of time to get this work done? <laughs> it's a lot. We think of uh, so long. We only have what 80, 90 years here if we're lucky. It's one life. We're going to be here 108 times and go back around. But this is already times. our 107th time. Well, I mean. You don't want to. You don't want to be getting down on yourself with that. But that is an important thing to bring up because someone else says leave nothing for your next life because you don't know if it's there. So do the work now, right? And someone did it in one lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, he said that in thirty years you could complete the whole thing, the mm -hmm. whole three mountains, in thirty years approximately. Right. So yeah. you are young and you start now. Mm -hmm. uh, by the end of your lifetime, you will be a master. <laughs> Those lives are going to happen. We're not so young anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not an excuse because you can still work, and then in your next life, you can. You got to think of your life. You got to think of your life as a totality. When you work till late, till in your life, the the divinity, the master, they will give you another life based on your merit, to, so that you continue your your work. Yeah, well, that's the thing. That's the thing that was kind of being expressed by this quote that I thought was so profound is the fact that, you know, a lot of people will discourage themselves and not work as hard. But the truth is, if they work harder, their being and this world will provide them everything they need. You know, people complain they don't have a partner to practice an alchemy. It just means they're not working hard enough. Yeah, when I write, and then when and then once they practice harder, yeah. it will present itself yeah. immediately. Just remember, those, those lives are going to go by. You're going to get those lives. And you know what? That the Might as well work with them. That discouragement and everything that could be your ego is too. Oh, it is. 100. percent All the discouragement is the ego. Yeah. 100. percent Oh my God, it's going to be so long. There's no maybe long. about it. Yeah. Saying, yeah. oh, it's too, too long. What's the point? I'm just going to ride this one out and do my le next life. That's an ego. You're going to observe. It. So, on the first mountain, we're going to start creating the solar bodies. And this is what we're doing by raising these, oh. raising these, raising the kundalini in these seven bodies. The physical and the etheric energies are refined. Right? We're not creating a new physical body, but we're refi refining the energies in it. The astral and the mental bodies are turned from, turned solar from lunar. So they're lunar right now, and then they're turned into solar bodies by raising the serpent. Okay, so in the physical and etheric are okay, our physical is just not, you're not changing it from lunar to solar. No, you're refining the energies. You're just refining so, yeah. the energies. So the, there is a change that takes place, but you don't take this body off and get a new physical body. No. The, no, no. the causal buddhic and atmic solar bodies are all created. Because like, like I said earlier, they don't exist in a lunar form. There's no, oh, okay. there's no lunar causal body. Okay. There's it only exists in astral and mental. Only, yeah, those are the four bodies of sin that we have. <laughs> Once we... You know, refine our it's physical and etheric energy. energies. We, we create solar, astral, mental. Then we can begin creating the solar, the three solar bodies higher than the other. Um, so the first mountain, mountain of initiation, right? As we raise the kundalini, we create the solar bodies. We just said that. As the kundalini rises, it awakens occult faculties. These are the chakras, right? It activates the chakras 
and these chakras increase intensity in each higher body created. So you raise the, raise the kundalini in the physical body and these chakras open up to a certain extent. Then the etheric body, they, they increase in intensity. Then you get a solar astral, they increase in intensity. And so, so in the physical body, maybe you start to become more intuitive. And then you know if you get the so then you get the solar mental even more intuitive and all that kind of thing. So these all increase. Yeah, one thing in, to mention is that when uh, the master says that when the kundalini awakens, you feel some kind of pain, uh, slight pain in the in the coccyx, mm -hmm. and then you start having more lucid uh, experiences. Right. Mm -hmm. And also the you are given the the flaming sword. Right. Because you need to defend yourself mm -hmm. against the entities. I do so talk when you awake the... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, no, it's for sure. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hope I put it in there now because I did it. I did it after. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. So, there are eight major initiations on the first mountain, like on all three mountains. Major initiations. Before we ascend, we must first descend. These are the inferred dimensions of the mental plane. It's on the first mountain. This is the abyss of the planet Earth. So we go into the interior of the planet Earth, the abyss, to, to eliminate egos. This is where we investigate our own egos and begin to eliminate them, yes. So, uh, so there are eight major initiations on the first mountain. Is that, and on each is, mountain. Is that your Kundalini? Uh, There's just eight particular, like, specific, we'll say large initiations on each mountain. Uh, okay. There's trials and tests all the way through. This has that Remember, there's a trial for every vertebrae that you raise it. But yes. there are eight, they call them major initiations. <laughs> So this is not, uh, we're not, this isn't uh, increasing your chakras, awakening. No, that's just, that, that's part of, that's part of the process of creating these solar bodies and raising the energies, and it gives you more power to work with, because now you have these, and like, I'm going to say now too, because maybe I didn't put it in there, but you are, when you create the solar bodies, you receive uh, a sword in the astral plane, and as you create more solar bodies, it gets longer and longer to help you def defend yourself against these entities oh. when you're in dealing with all these egos and the stuff that happens in the super sensible worlds. Um, this can be done consciously or in a dream when you're investigating these egos. Saw my all states. So here is the eight, eight initiations. This is, this is an abbreviated form. His book is way more in detail. The first initiation on the first mountain is the forming of the Philosopher's Stone. Uh, this has to do with, ch with chastity, willpower, and the idea of the sword and the stone. This sword we're talking about that you pull from the stone, you're pull pulling the sword uh, from from the philosopher's stone, the sword of the will, and you have to use your will to work in this this work of alchemy. That's this idea of chastity. Oh, so that's about as as quick as we're going to go. Oops. Top down on that. Okay. So yeah. So this is the first major initiation. Now, I'm going to go quick because I see that this isn't running long too. I don't think it was going to. But it's all right. That's all. All my lectures are like this. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. So the first one is, yeah, the chaff, the, the the sword and the stone. That story. Second one on the first mountain is injustice. This is where we're put in prison because we have to test our reaction to unfairness. So we're unjustly put in prison. The Psalm this happened in the physical. It wasn't wasn't mm -hmm. something that happened in the astral. So this can happen in the physical. He was physically imprisoned in um, I don't remember if it was Mexico or Colombia. In Colombia. In Colombia. So he was thrown in prison for teaching this stuff, uh, for practicing occult medicine, that kind of thing. Um, the third one is, is the emotions. We have to separate ourselves from our emotions in, in these tests. This is a specific one. We have to help others instead of helping ourselves. There is more information on these. This is pretty general, like I said, but we have three mountains to get through. So. Um, and the third one of the emotions, we're testing our emotions. This is when the solar astral body is created. Because the whole time we're working on raising that kundalini. It's not like step by step. You know, you don't raise the kundalini in all the bodies and then do the first initiation. This stuff's all happening. When you're on the mountain, you're continuously working in alchemy. Continuously working with the death of the ego and the sacrifice for humanity. Those three factors never stop. So when we separate ourselves from our emotions and help others ahead of helping ourselves, then we create the solar astral body. And then the solar astral plane becomes accessed. That's something we never really think of. But we create a solar astral body. Not only does it help us incarnate higher parts of the being, but we access higher parts of that plane of existence. And now we can get to higher levels of initiation. So before, we were only, we were only stuck in the lunar. Like right now, when you have an astral projection, it'll be, if you don't have a solar astral body, it'll be a lunar experience because you're in the lunar 
astral plane. The fourth one is the intellect. This is where peers turn against you. Like we said, this happens also in the physical, also in the super sensitive, uh, the super sensible dimensions. The peers can turn against you. You're, you're supposed to not react. You have to separate yourself from your mind, from your from the lower mind, the mind of the egos. And when you do this, the solar mental body is created, and now the solar plane is act, solar mental plane is accessed. So now you can reach higher levels of um, initiation, because now you go to the higher portion of that plane of existence. The initiate has now created the four solar bodies, right? We just got the, the, the physical, the etheric, the solar, and the mental. And he becomes a Buddha, right? <laughs> With the fourth, um, the creation of the fourth solar body, the, there is the disciple is considered to be a Buddha. <laughs> and there is a little bit more that happens right here. Though. So these are the four bodies created, right? But there's still nothing divine within the initiate, other than the essence. It's created this body. This is what this is what Samuel states in the Three Mountains. But what happens next is that um, the fifth one is choice, the fifth initiation. We must consciously choose between the esoteric work and family. This can be done like in the astral, in a dream, but it might seem physical, or maybe in the physical. Yeah. This is one of those things. And this is a choice to constantly do the direct path to the absolute. And it has to be a, a con the conscious decision to continue the work equals the causal body and the incarnation of the human soul. Now that you've created the body and the human soul incarnates into it. So this is when you've incarnated the human soul. Right, that's the, that's the level of Tiferet. Remember if you remember the Kabbalah. Where's Tiferet? Tiferet's this one. So that's that one. Yeah. The human soul. Sometimes it's called the animal soul. This one's called the human soul and the divine soul, or the animal soul and the human soul. But we call it the human soul and the divine soul. Okay. Um, and then the next initiation is obedience and faith. Master, the master is turned against you and you feel abandoned. Pe people who are leaders of, you know, the groups or maybe even masters in the super sensible direct, uh, dimensions will turn against you and you feel totally abandoned. Like, like I'm on this path, but why, why is everybody against me? You have to persevere. I mean, if you, if you persevere and you've had, now this is the Buddhic body, you incarnate the divine soul. Now you have those two, the two twin souls incarnated. You uncover work that's done in past existences before you fell, like all of us here have fallen. But once you reach this level, you'll remember the work you did. You'll probably remember when you were a master and when you fell. You'll remember your past lives and all the past esoteric work you've done. Because it's held in waiting by the being. I don't think I wrote it there, but the being, it's held in waiting by the being. When these two souls come together, you'll remember all that. The work isn't thrown out. We were all at one point divine, right? We all fell, and that's why we're here. That's the idea. We all fell. Maybe, maybe we just started as sparks, or maybe we were masters and we fell. But most likely, we were, we were all masters at one point and we fell. Now, all that, all the tests we went through before as masters, it didn't just get thrown away. The being, the, you know, the, the atma, the atmic, or the atman, the innermost, has all this for us in waiting. And then once we incarnate that, we'll remember. And the seventh one is. Uh, Initiation on chastity and lust. You're thoroughly tested on the egos of lust, physical in the physical and the internal worlds. And the, the lust comes up a lot, so you'll be tested a lot on that, because it's one of our largest egos. Um, if you pass that, that's the atmic body, you, and the incarnation of the atman, or the innermost. Right? The innermost. And uh, then something interesting happens at that point. Uh, when you when you incarnate the innermost, that's when you receive the esoteric esoteric title of master. The innermost has a particular name to each individual. Everyone has a a master, their own particular name. Karma must be balanced before the second mountain. All karma must be paid off before you start the second mountain. Karma is paid off by the work done on the first mountain. So while you're working on the first mountain, you're paying off karma because you're doing huge sacrifices for your being. You're doing, you know, super huge efforts to eliminate ego, all of this stuff. So this is this is going to balance your karma. If it's not totally balanced, Samuel talks about karma being shifted and being, you know, you can compensate for it and then you can continue on. And on the eighth, there's a rest. And, 
We must recuperate from the difficult work we have completed. There is no alchemy at this time. We take a break from that aspect of the three factors. For how long? It's all internal. Oh. It's all internal. So you'll know because it comes up. And then at a certain time we'll have a, we'll have a final initiation where we see ourselves dead in a coffin. Uh, Master Samuel talks about Anubis being there, presiding over it. This equals the death of 50% of our egos from the first mountain. The death of the egos, 50% someone else says. And the first mountain, although it's extremely, extremely difficult, it does not demand perfection, it says. Basically, you, you, you get through the test by the skin of your teeth. And it's hard, it's very difficult, and it's not as rigorous as what is ahead on the second mountain. And then we are put up against the final test. Um, when the time comes, we're placed in a situation that provokes us to react. We must be serene and patient, very patient. So if we pass, we advance to the second mountain. And Samuel talks about his experience with this one, where he was with a bunch of other masters in the, in the astral or in the super, super sensible dimensions, the higher dimensions. And they're told, okay, we're going to pass to the second mountain or this kind of thing. And they're waiting in this, I believe it was a cathedral. I might not have all the facts straight. But he's waiting with all of them, and they wait for a long, long, long time sitting there. People are agitated. People are getting, like, antsy. And he's the only one who sits there serenely and passively for a long time, longer than we could really even imagine, sitting there serenely. And he was the only one who passed that test and was able to advance. The master's come in and says, this, this man possesses something that no one else here possesses. And what is it? He says, patience and serenity. And that's this test. Because we can't be trying to race to the top of these mountains. It's not a race to get done. We, these... These initiations, this work has to be done thoroughly. It's not something like, yeah, let's just get this one over with and get on the next one. Each one is intense and thorough and has to be done. And this is what, in the book, The Three Mountains, he talks about this being the final test of the first mountain. And then from there, we go on to the second mountain, the mountain of resurrection, yes. So the, the rest and mm -hmm. the serenity and patience thing you were referring to, that would be considered as the... the going down the mountain? Sure. Is that what, is yeah. that what you mean by there being like kind of yeah. up and down? And then he talks about it in his book. He calls it the seven serpents of fire. You raise up the spine, then you receive seven serpents of light, which represents wisdom. It's always shown as going up and then down. The down is sort of the rest time and the knowledge you receive. And then you raise seven serpents of fire again, then seven serpents of light. Okay. And then seven serpents of fire, and then the absolute. So it, that's why it's generally depicted as a mountain. It's sometimes like a mountain like that gets gradually bigger. Okay. Because the work gets harder. And like we said, the second mountain is the mountain of resurrection. It is more thorough and difficult than the first mountain. There's finer details are tested in the second mountain. 50% of ego was eliminated on the first mountain. We are free from the wheel of samsara at this point. Like we said, when you have 50% ego uh, eliminated, you're free from the wheel of samsara. So you're not subjected to continual death, birth, and rebirth. We must continue the work of death or we will fall all the way back down to the beginning of the first mountain again. You have to keep dying to be zero. So we've, he says he's eliminated 50%. You still have 50%. You've only done half the elimination work so far. So there's a lot of work ahead. And again, you always have to descend before you ascend. On the first mountain, you descend into the abyss of the planet Earth. On the second mountain, Samuel says it's the abyss of other planets in our solar system. So we go to the different abysses of the moon, and Saturn, Mercury, Venus, all these places to investigate and eliminate ego. You must give yourselves 100% to the work in the three factors, birth, death, and sacrifice. It has to be done with a, with a level of 100%, 100% uh, actively pursuing these three factors at this point now. You can't be like, sometimes I'm doing this, sometimes I'm doing that. It's 100% giving yourself totally to the three factors. And then at this point, we complete the 12 labors of Hercules in the infernal worlds, the idea of the egos. I didn't get into each one, because I think we have a general idea of the Hercules story. And the, I guess it's not totally important to know every one of the labors, but if you want to, it's all in the book, The Three Mountains. He talks about it. Um, this must be completed before the initiation. And the labors correspond to the elimination of egos. So like the labors he goes through, like the first one, remember, he has to clean the stables of all his horses, so that's talking about the ego. He has to fight the hydra. He has to, he has to capture the golden fleece, 
I'm just going off the top of my head of some of the ones I remember off the top of my head. Um, there's, a, there's 12 waivers, and they all, they all relate to elimination of ego. They must, again, raise the seven serpents and the seven bodies. As soon as we start, like we said, as soon as we start this mountain again, we're giving ourselves 100% of the three factors. So that includes this part. We're raising the Kundalini through alchemy. We're raising the serpents. On the first mountain, remember, we created the, what's called the solar bodies. Well, there's more bodies. Because okay? they, they were vehicles to manifest the innermost. The innermost, which would be at the level of, what is that, Hesed. So this one, the innermost here. And now we're on the second mountain, so we create what's called the golden bodies, which is the higher octave of the solar bodies. Because now we're trying to manifest the Christ, the Christ force, which is a higher principle than the innermost. The golden bodies are created the same way as the solar bodies through alchemy. And the entire time we're practicing alchemy, we're practicing the death of the egos, practicing sacrifice for humanity also. That doesn't stop. So we know that there's more work. This is more work. We created solar bodies, now it's golden bodies. Um, in the internal worlds, the student must live out the events of initiation portrayed by the great exemplar, Jesus Christ, from birth to his resurrection. So this is, these are the major events we're playing out on the second mountain. The events of Christ's life. And that's why it's called the mountain of resurrection. And each one of the main events of his life corresponds to one of the main initiations. And that's why we said he opened up the path of initiation. This is initiation on the second mountain. So you remember the first mountain dealt a lot with the ego and the creating of our solar body so we get the we can finally get our soul and our innermost. Now this is the higher initiation. Yes? Now in uh, I know we explore a lot of different solar heroes mm -hmm. um, like the Buddha and <laughs> Krishna and um, oh, Osiris. And, and Osiris yeah. Um, so when it says uh, portrayed by Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. is because I know Buddha, like looking at the path of the Buddha, is it only goes to a certain extent, right. um, and then uh, I'm not sure how what the extent is with Osiris or Krishna. Right. Um, so basically, my question is: is when when they say uh, Jesus Christ, um, are they referring to? Um, other solar heroes as well, or just specifically each of the events that, that well, he experienced? particularly in the Gnostic system, it's the Gnostic Christian system. And okay. I believe there hasn't been a better exemplar. Oh, there's been other Christ figures. He portrayed the initiation most laid down, the most easiest to comprehend. So it is okay. specific to that. We're not saying, like, it's not the idea like Jesus Christ saves. We've will, we will all gone past that, right? This is the, the example of Jesus Christ. So it was the man Jesus who incarnated Christ and what he did. And what we're trying to do is incarnate the Christ too, through following his example, the man Jesus, what he did to incarnate his higher principles. The first one is called the Law of the Fall. And it's also related to the Nativity scene. So all our work is brought down to its lowest point. All the work of the first mountain is brought down to its lowest point. We feel totally abandoned by the masters. We're thrown into the primordial chaos. It's almost like we didn't even do the first mountain at all now. So it's, you can imagine how terrifying that would be after completing such a great work. We have to fight with faith, faith to emerge from this primordial chaos. Having this faith in emerging from the primordial chaos as opposed to feeling abandoned like, oh, the work's over, I failed. And then that's the opposite. If we, if we pass, we incarnate the Christ. And just like the nativity scene, the Christ is incarnated like the nativity scene. A small child in the manger still. We still have ego. The Christ force isn't powerful. That's why it's, that's why it's the baby. Right? And the manger represents the ego, and we're well aware of all those symbolisms now. Even our buddy the donkey's over there, we know what he rep represents. No, what does he represent? He's the mind. Oh, and we'll see him again later. And the cow? Cow is uh, maybe just an ego, an animal. Just the animal oh. ideas. The cow represents a lot of things in different cultures, but in this context, I don't think it's representing those things. Particularly in this painting, this is just a random painting. Who knows yeah. if they have these teachings in mind or not. Um, but we can't stop to rest on the second mountain at all. There is no rest. You don't stop fighting at all. Because there is a continual force opposing you on the, on the second mountain. So you have to all constantly fight to go up the mountain because that same pressure is pushing you backwards. So if, I, if you give yourself up a little bit to the three factors, you're going to get pushed down. This is, this, is the, this is what makes the second mountain so much harder. 
if you fail the second mountain, this is when you're in danger of becoming a Hannes Musin. And we've talked about this before a little bit, but this is a double center of gravity beam. Because you've created these solar bodies already, right? We haven't created the golden bodies yet. But now you could be, there'll be your, your innermost, who's a divine master, and the same as an evil entity. So there could be this evil being now with all these powers, because it has access to the solar bodies and everything, but it's failed the second mountain, hasn't resurrected, hasn't incarnated the Christ force. Now, Hannes Musen is a, a double center of gravity, is what they call it. It's what happens if when a master fails to a certain extent. And that's also in, mm, what is it, The Conjuration of Four. Remember the story of Andremelech? There's a good one and an evil one because that was a Hannes Musen. So why is it a bad guy? Why is it a good guy? Why is there two? It doesn't make sense. What about a master who had, or initially who was working to incarnate his father who was in secret, but didn't incarnate it, but still had retained those other powers? So his father, who is in secret, stays divine. He doesn't fall. His father who is in secret is perfect. But to this point up to here, there's another master, which they call, who awakens in darkness for the pur purpose of darkness. So there is, there is danger on the second mountain. And that's, pr that's primarily the main danger. Become a double center of gravity B. Um, and then the second initiation, right, is baptism. Before I go on to that also, that's the, also in the... The Christian depiction, why, you know, Jesus goes into hiding, basically. Because we don't hear about him again until he's a man. He's born, then he's a man. The idea is he goes into hiding while we're doing the 12 labors of Hercules and all this kind of stuff and eliminating the ego and working on the ego. Because it's so dangerous for the Christ force still in that manger until we clean that manger. The Christ force is small. Then once we get further along in those works, the baptism comes. This is the second initiation on the second mountain. Uh, right. Since the birth in the manger, the Christ has been in hiding. We must truly feel a genuine longing for the Christ. So we're working intensely on the egos and the three factors. But we have to have that longing for the Christ, which seems easy, but it's difficult because the Christ isn't us, or what we, con what we consider us. Right? We're still considering ourselves as all the egos we carry, and that's 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 what we are. The longing for the Christ will be the annihilation of all those things that we're attached to. If we pass, the Master is revealed and begins teaching. This is the idea. Like when Jesus first reappeared and began his teachings. Um, and then it uh, culminates with the baptism. Uh, the idea that that's when the Master appears at the baptism. Right? That's the idea of being the born again. That's where they get the born again. That's why they still practice baptisms. I didn't explain that one very clearly in that last slide. And this thing's messing up, so I don't want to go back. But... The idea of the baptism is when the master is revealed and starts teaching. This is when we were born again. We had this Christ principle within us. The third one is temptation and rejection. And this we go through the 40 days and nights, the temptations of Lucifer. Samuel talks about this, that it's all these initiations on the second mountain are felt with our physical body as if it's physically happening to us. Although it's these happen in the super sense of the Super sensible dimensions, the higher dimensions. And these tests will continue to happen in your daily life, too, in the physical plane. Because remember, you still have those tests and trials of each vertebrae. Right? Christ begins teaching and is rejected. That happened at the very first of his, of his teaching career, right? And has to find disciples of his own. This goes on, too, in the initiation process. When you pass, the Christ enters the golden astral body. And then you can enter into the heavens of the other planets now, the, the, or what we could consider the, you know, solar realms of them, if you will. But since we're in, we're higher than the solar bodies now, so they're called the heavens. You can enter the heaven of the moon. With each initiation, you can enter the different heavens of the different planets to receive teachings. And... Yes. Um, with the disciples thing, does that imply that one who begins on the second mountain needs to take on physical disciples? Um, yeah. Yeah, he talks about it being in internal worlds too, but it does correlate for sure. Okay. And um, because your teaching is going to be rejected, like the Gnostic teachings when Samuel first came, there's a lot of backlash. So we had disciples or followers of his own, basically, right? Because basically for the few. Um, yeah, but uh, uh, you can take disciples from the very beginning of the first initiation, the first mountains. You can take disciples. It doesn't matter. Right. The master somehow took them before, right, but I think in this case, the it refers might refer to the parts of the being, 
because the disciple, the inner Christ, has different right. parts of the being. So right. it might be uh, the interaction with those parts For of the being. Sure. So that is also a good point. We always got to think about how it correlates to our own internal parts of our own being. Good point. I'm glad you're on top of this stuff because I did throw this <laughs> together. But uh, <laughs> that other lecture on the weekend, too, right? So I'm doing two of them, but I'm not, not to make excuses. But yeah, the other parts of the being internally. You still have internal parts of your being that are revolted, revolting against you, you're not united yet, right? Oh, okay. And all of this stuff is, is uh, in the super sensible dimensions, meaning in the higher planes of existence. The macrocosm. The macrocosm, yes. Yeah. And microcosmically, it happens internally in us. And the fourth initiation is Palm Sunday. Right? The Christ spreads the teachings, and you face many obstacles and attacks. The idea is that. The Christ force spreading the teachings. The Christ force is getting stronger and stronger internally. Spreading the teachings, getting stronger. And there's all kinds of attacks still from the egos and the opposing forces of that Christ force. When you pass this, the Christ enters the golden mental body, right? That's why he's riding the donkey. That's the mental body. Now the Christ force is in the mental body. The obstacles and attacks are from the mental plane, from our own internal mental psychology. This is the problems that he's facing, the Christ force is facing within us, right? So the whole time we're doing this, we're, we're, we're sort of right now in the mindset of thinking, okay, now, so the initiate is the Christ doing this stuff. No, the whole idea is this is the Christ force growing within the initiate, right? So internally this force is growing. It doesn't mean that you have to physically act out all this stuff. And to point that out, Doris Mill, the, the, the Christ force is growing within the initiate. It's incarnating to the different bodies within the person. Mm -hmm. So the idea of being physical, physically happening isn't the most important. Although there, there is correlations, but the idea is that Christ faced all his obstacles, then passed and enters the golden mental body. So now this master is at a higher stake. So now the Christ force is in the mental body. Um, this is, enters the heavenly Jerusalem, riding the donkey. So that's the idea of control over the mind now. The Christ force is control over the mind. When we talked about um, Gnostic Kabbalah, we talked about the, the Christ force being a, like a universal consciousness too. So that's the idea there. And the fifth one is the Mount of Olives. You guys remember that story? That's where he's praying so hard. He's bleeding on the stones. And, Father, let this cup pass from my lips. But if it's your will, let it be done, not mine. And the disciples were sleeping. That's that. So that's definitely isolation and abandonment. You have all these internal feelings of isolation and abandonment. A lot of the tests relate to that. A lot of tests relate to you like, yeah, you're not doing good on the path. You're not, your work's not good, and you're not right. It's a lot of, yeah. Does this also, the, I, like a lot of the, like you were saying, I have isolation and abandonment, does this relate to the, um, the, psycholo or the spiritual day and spiritual night? Um, yeah, it, it can. I don't know exactly how. Uh, so maybe. This, yeah, because we all go through the no, days. No, good we all go through <laughs> the days and the nights, right? The idea is that we're, we're trying to stay within a day on the mountain because it's a continual effort. So the night is when we entropy comes in and we fall back down and we're in a psychological night where we're not doing the work. The idea is that can't really happen on the second mountain. Because okay. if you get pushed back down through entropy, then you're going to be in danger of falling to a hounds mucin and you can lose all the work you've done. Okay. So it's not exactly the same in, in that sense. But I mean, it can happen. Right? It can happen. So when you pass this test, then the Christ enters the golden council body. And the crown chakra opens, Samuel tells us. And in the internal world, this is also represented by the crown of thorns, where you feel the thorn, crown of thorns. You feel like it's physically on you, and the blood runs down, and it's painful. And because it's painful, because now you're working on the cause egos. The cause egos are the first manifestations of ego in the council world. You work on them on the golden council body. But once these egos are eliminated, there's no ego that remains. Samuel tells us. On the cause of ego, it's like the little, the smallest seeds of ego where they first originate oh. in the council plane. Okay. That's why we could never really even eliminate our ego 100 percent without creating these higher bodies because we don't even have a council body, right? But that's where the seeds of the ego originate. So once we've completed that work, no ego remains. The sixth initiation on the second mountain is the trial, where you're falsely accused, rejected, and condemned. So again, we're working with these same type of egos. The idea, well, when you're falsely accused and rejected and condemned, just like Christ showed, you know, so you know that it's, it's a false accusation. 
you have to deal with the rejection, you have to deal with being condemned, and all of this thing. When you pass this, this is when the Christ enters the, go the golden Buddhic body. So, I mean, that's an intense trial also. And Samuel goes into more depth. I'd like to go into more depth, but you see how long my lectures go when I'm just skimming the surface. I'm just talking too much. So, um, and the seventh is the actual crucifixion. The crucifixion, where the initiate is crucified and dies upon the cross in the internal worlds. When you pass this, the Christ enters the golden atmic body, and the Father is incarnated. This is the incarnation of the Father. And then the eighth is the resurrection. So we can see how the whole Christ story plays out with all these initiations. You spend three symbolic days in the sepulchre, uh, then the Christ resurrects. Then there's a rest at the end of the second mountain after this. This is the idea of the resurrection. So those are the, those are the major initiations you go through on the second mountain. And I definitely didn't get into the third mountain. I mean, we will get into it a little bit, just an overview of it, but not initiation by initiation. In the second mountain, the initiate has incarnated the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So this is all that's been incarnated, this Christ principle. And this operates under three laws. The three laws of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The absolute is one law. So we can see the initiation work that we have to do. And the third mountain is merging the three laws into the one. The third mountain equals complete death and merger into one. Totally absolved, or absorbed into the Father, Psalm Idol tells us. This is 100% free from ego now. We've eliminated the causal egos, the cause egos. We return to the absolute, return to the origin. This all happens on the third mountain. And it has particular initiations, and you can read about it too in Samuel's book. But generally, even when I got this course, we didn't talk about it in great lengths. So this, is, this is very advanced. Okay. Um, you return to the absolute. Like everyone, every spark returns to the absolute. If you do it this direct path, the razor's edge, you return with self-awareness and with freedom. The idea that you've done it consciously and you're self-aware of what it is, as opposed to the sparks who go through the second death. This is a mystical death, right? You guys remember the difference between the mystical death and the second death? Mystical death is consciously dying to your egos and consciously taking up this path. The second death is going around the wheel of samsara, going back down through the infernals, and then dying, dying in the ninth sphere, and then you return back to the absolute, but more like unaware, almost like a, a child in a, in a womb kind of, a, that kind of consciousness. Now another interesting thing is that every master who completes the third mountain and wants to stay in the absolute must leave behind, uh, as we'll say, an apprentice. So there always has, I mean, every master has to leave behind an apprentice. So Samuel says, the apprentice must be on the second or third mountain. A master is kept alive while on the second and third mountain so he can leave behind an apprentice. This is part of the sacrifice for humanity. So people always have to be working for this. So the idea that people who are on these mountains are spreading the teachings with their sacrifice for humanity and all that. And they can't truly ascend into the absolute without leaving behind an apprentice. Only then can a master ascend into the absolute if there's an apprentice working on the second and third mountain. This is more... Masonic propaganda that we always throw in. Oh. <laughs> I know. Move, move the mouse a bit over. It's because you're over top. There you go. <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> Return to the absolute equals final liberation. That's the final liberation. That's the entire goal of the Gnostic path. Is this final, final liberation? Yes. So Im implied that we're leaving behind mm -hmm. an apprentice mm -hmm. before the return to the absolute. So is it implying the, the physical death or is it implying something else? I think you have to have, you have to have, before you return to the absolute, you have to have an apprentice on the physical earth who's on the second or third okay. So teachings can be spread. That's the way I understood it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, that's right. The master left one. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah. He did. Because, like we know, the master wasn't the only master. There's, there are others. This has been, as you've probably noticed already, a general overview of the first and second mountain. 
with a very brief mention of the third mountain. Because it is an, an intense amount of information. For more in-depth information, see the work The Three Mountains by Selma Elmo. So it's in that book. Also, there's, there's parts in the probative path and the perfect matrimony. There's parts of in the initiation into the tarot and cabal in that book. And, uh, yeah. <coughs> the end. Uh -huh. <laughs> Didn't work. <laughs> 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 the end.